uh, please take your seats. So our Bible reading this morning is from Esther chapter 4, and uh, this is on page 503 of the Church Bibles. If you'd like a Bible, do, uh, do just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. So Esther's just before Job, which is just before Psalms. For some reason I always think Esther's after the Psalms and can never find it. So uh, yeah, uh, page 503 of the, uh, of the Church Bibles. Okay, starting to read at verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city, in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence, to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will rise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. May God bless the reading of his word. We've been looking over the last few months at Bible characters. And one of the things we've been doing is we've been looking at Bible characters is we've been exploring the whole of their story or significant bits of their life story. So though our reading has been from Esther chapter 4, what we're actually going to do is look at quite a lot of the book of Esther. So if you would like to follow it with the assistance of a Bible, here's a second opportunity uh, to get hold of one. And uh, so uh, is there anybody who would like one? Maybe we can have some handed out. Thank you. Whilst the Bibles are being handed out, I'd like you to think of the most dangerous job you could imagine being asked to do. What do you think the most dangerous job you could be given is? Bomb disposal? Lion tamer? Working on a skyscraper. Working on a skyscraper, firefighter, fisherman, Formula One driver, maybe? In the Persian Empire, 
the most dangerous job was being queen. Or to be precise, being one of the main wives of the Persian ruler. The rulers thought they were above the law and could do what they liked. The Persian rulers called themselves Shah of Shahs, which means King of Kings or Lord of Lords. And that title was adopted by Alexander the Great when he eventually defeated the Persian Emperor and then was adopted by the Romans when 300 later they conquered the territory ruled by Alexander the Great's successors. So you don't know why the title King of King and Lord of Lords comes from that we sing in so many songs. It was first of all a political title used by the Persian emperors. And that is why it was so controversial for the Christians to claim that it wasn't the emperors who were God and in charge, it's Jesus. Now the book of Esther is set in the reign of the emperor Xerxes or Asueros. There are three emperors uh, we know of in that name, but the story is most likely to be set in the reign of Xerxes I, uh, 486 to 465 BC. And the story begins in chapter 1 by telling us that Xerxes ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. Xerxes' empire was the, height, was the size of the Ottoman Empire at its height. And in the middle of that vast territory was Susa, where he had his palace. Now Xerxes was pretty impressed at the fact that he ruled so much land. And he wanted everybody else to be impressed too. So we're told in Esther chapter 1 verse 4 that for a full 180 days he held an exhibition where he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendour of his majesty. And after his 180 day exhibition, far grander than anything pulled off for the Olympics or the Millennium Dome or anything else, he holds a banquet, a seven day festival of eating and drinking. Now, we don't quite catch in the church Bible the significance of this festival of eating and drinking. It was, in the original language that it was written in, a men-only party. Last year, I went to a wedding that started at lunchtime. By the time I arrived at 6 p.m. in the evening, there were guests who were already completely drunk. At that sort of, I love you, you're my best friend, kind of stage of things. We are told in Esther chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, that the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. What do you think the state of the building and of the guests would have been after seven days of eating and drinking without any limits? Now, at the same time, Aceros's chief wife Vashti is also holding a separate banquet for the women in the royal palace, we're told in verse 9. Uh, we're not giving any details about that, but I suspect it may have had a slightly different tone from the one that Asueros was running. And then we're told at uh, chapter 1, verse 10, that by the seventh day of the uh, banquet, Asueros was drunk. He's shown off all the wealth of his kingdom to impress his guests, and now he's thinking, what else can I do in order to impress my guests? I know what I'm going to do. I am going to get my wife, Queen Vashti, to come in and make an exhibition of herself. He wants her to come into the room wearing her royal crown so that she can show off her beauty to his nobles and other officials. Do you think that room, full of men who've been drinking for a week, would have been a safe space for Queen Vashti? Of course not. And so she refused to come. Now, Seros was a megalomaniac, a show-off, and a bully. He was very angry at Vashti's refusal to come. 
to ask 17 senior officials for advice about what to do, and naturally, bearing in mind how drunk the king is, they tell him what he wants to hear. They tell him that Vashti's disobedience is an act of disrespect, a potential source of social unrest. She should be stripped of her rank and restricted to the harem. In effect, put in imprisonment, house arrest for life. Now, the writer of the book of Esther tells us all of this in order to help us understand the political system that Esther is going to find herself one day involved in. A system in which the man at the top is vain, self-obsessed, bullying, and unpredictable. What matters to him is his own power, and he sets the tone from the top. You know the tone from the top, the way in which organizations can end up behaving in the way that the people in charge do. You know, the guy at the top kicks the people next out, down, they then kick the people, and so on and so on, until so eventually the dog kicks the cat and the cat kicks the mouse. Well, um, we see this expressly in the book of Esther. At, at the end of chapter one, we are told the king, not just content with stripping Vashti of her rank, sends dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household. Well, I'm in charge in my house, you need to be in charge in yours. This is a system in which the tone from the top is violent, unpredictable, and misogynistic. Chapter 2 of Esther begins when Aseros has sobered up. He realises that he has created a vacancy for a royal wife. And his personal attendants propose that a search should be made for beautiful young virgins. They organise a Miss World competition in which the king will have his pick of the most beautiful young women from every province in his realm. The emphasis on young, which is repeated in verses 2 and 3, is somewhat chilling. Aceros's officials were rounding up teenage girls who'd be forced to parade before the emperor who was, by now, in his very late 30s. And Esther is one of those who is brought to the citadel of Susa. She was, in today's terms, trafficked from wherever in modern-day Iraq Mordecai and her had lived into what is today part of Iran. Are you beginning to get the sort of sense of menace and danger and fear that operates in this place. So in those circumstances, she is looking at a beauty competition in which each contestant is taken and has to have sex with the king. And first prize is he can call on you whenever he likes for the rest of life, but you'll get a title of queen. And the second prize is you go off and you join Vashti in the gilded cage of the harem, house arrest for life. That's what the job options are that are available as a result of this interview that you never asked for. So how does Esther survive in this unsafe, exploitative work environment? The first thing we see in the book of Esther is that she takes advice. We're told in verse 15 of chapter 2 that when her turn came, she asked for nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, suggested. That's the first thing we see. The second thing we see is that Esther's uncle, Mordecai, has followed her to Susa. And we're told every day he walks backwards and forth in the court, near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther is and what is happening to her. Esther has people praying for her. And then at the end of chapter 2, we discover something else. Mordecai discovers that two of the ruler's officers are planning to assassinate him. Mordecai gets a message to Esther, 
And we're told then in verse 22 that when Esther warned the king, she gave credit to Mordecai. You know, those difficult, hostile, uh, competitive environments we can find ourselves in. What do people do in those circumstances? Well, what you try and do is you try and pass as much blame for anything onto other people and you take, try and take as much credit as possible yourself. I was talking to a young lawyer on um, Friday who was explaining his career and his personality type. And he said, you know, when I joined this new firm, I did a personality test. And it said, I'm one of these people who takes too much credit for things. And I thought, yeah, I know lots of lawyers who are like that. Anything brilliant, it's all me. Anything bad, it's always someone else. In this environment, Esther stood out because she gave credit to others. And then in Esther chapter 3, we discover that Aceros isn't the real villain in this story. The real villain in this story is a man called Haman. Now, Haman wasn't mentioned in chapter 1 when we were looking at the seven wise men advising the king. So he's had a pretty rapid rise to the top of Persian politics. He's become the king's prime minister. We are told that Haman is an Agite. King Agag was king of the Amalekites. Historical enemies of Israel who'd attacked the Jews during the Exodus, we're told in Exodus 17, and who King Saul had fought against, we're told in 1 Samuel 15. Haman's hatred of the Jews is deep in his bones. He was probably brought up to despise, hate, and fear them as his people's long-term enemy. So Haman goes to the king with a bribe. The bribe is 10,000 talents of silver. It would take an ordinary worker 16 years to earn one talent of silver. The modern day value of the bribe was three and a half billion US dollars. And he demonizes the Jews. He describes them as a certain people who keep themselves separate, who follow different customs from all other, those of all other people, who do not obey the king's laws. What he says is, in short, a lie. But it's a plausible lie. And the king has three and a half thousand million reasons to believe it and that's where we found ourselves at the beginning of chapter four and at the beginning of our reading when the news comes to Mordecai he tears his clothes he puts on sackcloth and ashes he goes out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly now actually the way he's dressed is a bit odd because it means he can't get through he hasn't the right, got the right dress code to get inside into the palace Esther it appears is completely unaware of what is going on but Mordecai's protests bring the atten his issue to the attention of Esther's officials the eunuchs and the female attendants who serve her Esther doesn't understand the problem immediately in her position, she doesn't see it. And so she has to ask them to go and find out why Mordecai is upset. Another thing that makes her distinctive in this dog-eat-dog -dog competitive environment is that Esther listens to the concerns of others. Now, when I was preaching a month ago, I looked at the lessons from the life of the unnamed slave girl. One of the things that struck me when I read through the book of Esther recently is just how many characters are named in it. The book of Esther is just full of names. The story isn't simply about how God used Esther in the precarious position of privilege she found herself in. It's also about how God used everyone else who were links in the chain. 
So as well as Esther and Mordecai, the heroes of the Book of Esther include Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the women, Hathak, the eunuch who goes to find out what's troubling Mordecai and who reports back faithfully and accurately to Esther. Do not underestimate the importance of reporting back faithfully and accurately. And we know what's happened to a Russian general recently who did that with Vladimir Putin. He lost his job for simply telling the truth about how badly the war in Ukraine was going. The female attendants too, though they're not named, are also key parts of this story. And so we have yet another reminder of what I was trying to get across last month. That we may feel like our part is limited and our role is limited, but actually we can be doing key things uh, in partnership with God. So Esther hears the news. The Jews are going to be exterminated. That is Haman's plan. That is what is about to happen. And Esther's response is, do you know how high the stakes are for me if I get involved here? She says in chapter 4, verse 11, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. They will be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter and spares their life. You see, what's happened by this time is that it's been a month since the king last asked to see Esther. 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Esther's worried that Asuerus, this highly sexed, highly volatile man, has gone off her. Her charms are fading. She is in real jeopardy, no idea what sort of reception she is going to get. And then we get that famous passage. I'm sure you all recognize the words at the end of it. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. But if, if you're silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for touch such a time as this. Read in full, how encouraging is that? You see, it's, it's, it's a combination, isn't it, of confidence that God will deliver God's people with challenge to Esther to be responsible for playing the part that God has called her to play. Yeah, we, we often quote that end bit, you know, who knows, but you've come to your royal position for such time as this. But skip over the bit where... Mordecai says, well, you know, if you keep silent, that's fine. God will rescue the Jews somewhere else. But you and your family, you'll, you'll all perish. You see, the reality is we don't often know why God has put us in particular situations until after the event. And sometimes we may never know at all. We have to trust that God has put us in the right place until God shows us that it is time to move on. And so Esther now faces calling the meeting that she's been dreading. You ever had to go to a meeting you were dreading? Do you remember what your heart rate feels like as you come towards the door? When I was training as a, as a lawyer, um, I didn't actually have a desk. A, a, and part of what I had to do was, was sort of go around the building and try and find a, a seat I could sit in. A, and the good days were where you knew you'd find the seat of somebody who was either definitely away or 
would be kind to you if you suddenly had to pick up all your stuff and move very quickly. And the times you would fear were, I don't know, if I go into that room and sit there and they come back, I'm going to get in there. So if I go into that room and they're there, they're going to be grumpy and tell me to get out. I'm going to get my, an earful. She has to face the far greater risk than that. She could literally get her head ripped off if she caught the king in a bad mood. So what does Esther do? Well, she has to trust God has put her in the right position. She then asks all the Jews to fast for her. And although Esther doesn't say it, you know, the Bible always associates fasting and prayer. Going into this key, difficult meeting, she asks for prayer and support. And she makes it clear that she and her attendants are going to fast as well. She was not too proud to personally get involved in praying and fasting. And then she does something quite remarkable. She tells Mordecai, when it's done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther put her mission above her own career, above her own personal safety. That's a big ask, but it's what God may call us to as the price for being involved in God's plans. So she prays and she fasts and then she acts. She takes her life in her hands and goes to see the king. And she finds the king in an upbeat mood. The king is showing off again. So he announces to everyone listening that he's so pleased with Esther that she can ask for anything she likes, even up to half his kingdom. Does he mean it? Of course he doesn't mean it. And no one there thinks he does either, but it's just another power play. Look, I could give away half my kingdom. It wouldn't make any difference. I'd be no poorer. Of course I can do this. And then something really interesting and surprising happens. King's in a good mood. Well, what do you do? You, you strike while the iron's hot, don't you? So what does Esther do? She invites the king and Haman to a banquet. Now, why should she do that? King's already in a good mood. But she knows what he, what he likes. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That was certainly true with the king here. So she invites him to a banquet because she knows that he loves eating and eating drinking and the banquet goes really well and he says this is fantastic i'm really enjoying this, this is great uh what do you want and she says i'd like you to come to another banquet tomorrow you see esther chooses her moment wisely she doesn't present her request the first moment she approaches the king she doesn't e even uh, present her request during the first banquet. She sets the scene carefully. When we are dealing with difficult people, whether at work or elsewhere, we need much wisdom to know when is the right time to do or to say something. And then when she speaks, Esther starts with her strongest card. She pleads for her own life first before she pleads for the life of her people. And she puts a spin on her request. She says, I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed or annihilated. If we'd merely been sold as slaves, I'd have kept quiet because no such distress would have justified disturbing the king. We'd have been okay with being slaves, but actually we're going to be wiped out. And so Esther's pleas win the heart of the volatile king. Overcome with rage, he steps out of the room. Now, at this point, Haman realises he's a dead man. You know, this is, this is winner takes all here. 
And if Esther has got the heart of the king, Haman has had it. So he decides he's got a better chance if he pleads with Esther for his life than if he pleads with the king for his life. So he goes over to Esther. Now, all that does, of course, is make things worse because the king comes back into the room, sees Esther and Haman on the couch together and thinks that Haman is making sexual advances. And so Haman is taken out and executed. All of us, some of us, may have had to work in extremely challenging work environments with difficult bosses at times. I suspect few of us have found ourselves in quite such extreme situations as Esther did. But many of us have to work in situations where our bosses are bullies, the workload is oppressive, the working environment seems unsafe. The book of Esther shows us how God can call us into and use us even in such difficult circumstances shows what God can do for us and through us if we're prepared to take advice, ask others to pray for us, give credit to others, listen to the concerns of others, trust that God has put us in the place we want to be, concentrate on the big picture, choose our moments and present our case. So the message of Esther is that it wasn't the king as Eros who was in control. The message of Esther is that as uh, Stephen drew out when looking at David's prayer, wealth and honour come from God. God is the ruler of all things. In God's hands are strength and power. And so we need to trust him to help us survive, not only to survive, but also to serve, even in the most difficult circumstances. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the encouragement of the life of Esther. We thank you that even when you seem to be absent or behind the scenes, even when circumstances are difficult, and we're called to work with or under those we find challenging. That you want to equip us and work through us. Well, we know that there are no guarantees that we'll always get the right outcome, but help us to be faithful servants, prepared uh, to do the right thing at the right time. Amen.